Welcome to Global Public Health Podcasts, where we learn from each other about the global and local intersections in health. Hi, I'm your host, Lauren Clark. I'm a professor of nursing at the University of Utah College of Nursing, and I'm bringing to you stories from students with insights into global health. So a number of years ago, I was sitting in the same seat that the students are sitting in today in global health. And I remember sitting there at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona in my global public health class. And it happened at the end of my five-year nursing program. And I remember saying to myself, I hope this is it. Because every other nursing clinical experience I'd had until that point had been a mess. And when I say that, I mean it was sort of like Goldilocks. I walked into the new clinical, I took the class, I went to the clinical experience, and at the end I said, oh, this is not it. This is, the kids are too little and too fragile, or the patients are too old and too sick, or the environment's too technical, and, and I'm a little scared practicing nursing here. And every clinical I had, I thought, I don't know if I can be a nurse. This is not going to work for me. And then when I walked into the global public health nursing class, I had a pretty good feeling because at the front of the room was Mary Alexander, and there she was, this little wizened old public health nurse who I dearly loved, and she was wearing her gold pendant. And this pendant hung on a gold chain around her neck, and it was a globe, and it had the whole world right there, and covering the world on every continent was a red ruby. And I said to Dr. Alexander one day, tell me about those rubies. What does that pendant represent? And she said, oh, these are all the places I've lived all around the world. And these are the different places where I worked as a public health nurse. I worked on sewage and sanitation projects with communities. I worked uh, in infant health. I worked in nursing education. And she told me a lot of stories about her life. And I came away saying, now that's what I could sink my teeth into. That's the kind of nursing that makes a difference. That's the kind of nursing that sets me up for an adventure that's really going to help and make the world a better place. So I said, I got this. To start my journey as a fledgling public health nurse, I had a summer free right before my last semester of nursing school. And I went through the Indian Health Service book that listed all of the co-step nurse internships available in the United States. Out of 52 potential listings, there was one that really stood out. It was in Lame Deer, Montana on the Northern Cheyenne Service Unit. And working for the Indian Health Service seemed like a natural for me. For one thing, I'd been raised in Tucson, Arizona, and grown up with Tohono O'odham friends, Yaqui friends, friends who were Navajo, some from the Apache Reservation. And I really loved these friends and learned a lot from them and had a basic understanding of some of the history and some of the beliefs of different Native American tribes. And I said, maybe I can learn some more. Maybe I can be of help. So after the last day of school that semester, I got in my truck and I drove straight north through Arizona, straight north through Utah. I took a ride at Wyoming, drove through that state, and then halfway through Montana. And outside of Custer Battlefield, I parked my pickup truck in front of my basement apartment and I started my semester as a public health nurse intern in Lame Deer, Montana. My first day of work, I was introduced to my mentor, Nancy, and the most important thing she did was assign me to a community health representative. And this man was a Vietnam War veteran and medic. He was native Cheyenne, spoke fluent Cheyenne language, and was my um, community health representative that would take me around in our red suburban from house to house as we made different visits, set up local uh, health events, and coordinated with the clinic. His name was Ralph, and he was an invaluable asset. He often did introductions at the door, and because he knew so many people there in Lame Deer and the surrounding towns, he was able to broker an introduction. He was able to explain things in ways that I could not, and he really facilitated in every way the work of the public health program there. But one day I decided that I had probably made so much progress that I could try one day without Ralph. And I asked him to just stay back and take it easy. I I had this. I was going to make a visit to the Yellowknives because the Yellowknife family had a six-month-old and a three-year-old little boy, and both of them were very far behind 
in immunizations. The three-year-old only had one set of DPT immunizations, and the six-month-old hadn't started any immunizations yet. And as I prepared for the home visit, I thought, what's it going to take to get this family to the clinic? Do they have a transportation issue? Maybe I can help with that. Maybe they have some social issues going on. Maybe they need some referrals for food. Maybe there's a substance abuse issue in the home. Maybe the, the mom has some postpartum depression I can talk with her about. But I really circled on my planning sheet that day, knowledge. It's quite possible. They just don't know and understand what a difference immunizations can make. So I set off in the Red Suburban all by myself, and I drove through the reservation, and I followed the directions I was given. Down that dusty road, take a left at the twisted tree, follow that a few miles, and just past the gully, turn right, and then park your, park your truck right before you get to that house with the uh, yellow front and the red roof. And as I rounded that last corner, I was chased, as usual, by a pack of reservation dogs. And they were right there at the door when I opened my, my car door and went up to the front door of the house. And when I knocked there, I said um, that my name was Lauren Clark and I had come from the Lame Deer Indian Health Service unit and I was there to talk to them about immunizations for the kids. And Martha Yellowknife said, do you think I'm stupid? And I said, oh, not at all. Not at all. But a lot of parents don't understand what measles can look like in a baby. And then I went on to describe pretty briefly what would happen for a, an infant who wasn't given the measles vaccination series and what measles could do in terms of uh, meningitis, in terms of hearing loss, and just um, you know the, the misery of having a sick baby. And she said, you're just not getting it, are ya? She said, vaccines are part of genocide, perpetrated against my people by white people like you. And I suggest you get back in that suburban and drive back to the clinic and don't come bothering us again. And then she slammed the door. And I turned around and I walked back to the suburban, past those barking reservation dogs. And I got back in the car and on my long journey back to the clinic by myself, I thought for the first time, but not for the last time. Hmm, global public health. It's not that simple. Thanks for tuning in to the Global Health Podcast, where we learn from each other about the global local intersections in health. I'm Lauren Clark. Thanks for joining us.